Thank you. I don't know about the songwriter poet thing, but. Um, so I, I, I try to pick interesting titles to, to get people to come. Um, this is one that, that I stole from a, a popular TV show. In fact, I haven't had a TV for 20 years. That's how popular it is that I knew about it. And uh, what I'm going to do today is, is go through this, but there are some alternative titles that, that I could have used, and you'll see why. Um, one is a toad is a toad is a toad. The other one is right back where we started. The other title could have been see what happens when money gets involved. Another title could have been duh. I'm not even sure if that's how you spell it, but some of the things I'll talk about will make you go duh. Uh, before I start, though, to explain any of those titles, I always start with this Bantu proverb that I learned while working in Southern Africa. It loosely translated, it means people are people through other people, or I am because we are. And so I never give a talk without thanking the people that have made me who I am, my family. This is an old photograph, they won't let me be in them anymore. But my mom and my dad, for their love and support over 50 years. Um, this woman, who as of yesterday, has been my partner for 31 years, that's why I almost rescheduled this trip. But turns out she was traveling anyway, so we celebrated a day early. And then these two, my son Tyler and my daughter Cassina, these are also old pictures. Uh, they're the old prom pictures, and I show them because they were both incredibly proud moments for me. In fact, I don't know which made me prouder, that my son borrowed my tie for his prom, or that my daughter borrowed my earrings for her prom. It, it's, it, it, they, were, they were both just the kinds of moments that, that dads remember. I want to thank all the funding sources. And as you've heard, this is also my disclosure, I have been funded by a chemical manufacturer, but not anymore. You know, there's that old saying, if you're not pissing somebody off, then you're probably not doing anything important. I'm pretty important by that standard. <laughs> I want to thank all of the students that have been involved, everybody in blues and undergraduate that has been involved in the work that I'll talk about. Uh, and there's a couple of these. And here's my latest lab, um, and, and including Kara, who spent a year here at Michigan as a new graduate student of mine. Um, incredible group of people, incredibly diverse group of people with just d illustrates the creativity that you get when you throw all kinds of people together. And finally, I dedicate this to my grandmother who, luckily before she passed on a few years back, she passed on to me her love of education and, and her desire to make the world a better place. She also taught me that if you want to get a point across, don't preach, don't teach, don't give lectures, just tell a good story. So, so I'm going to do my best today to tell you a good story. And only a little bit of that story is going to involve atrazine. So I want to give some of that as a background. Most of the stuff I'll talk about today is new stuff. Most of it, in fact, is unpublished stuff. I want to, this is my grandmother's house. And I always like to include this too because it was in my grandmother's backyard. And what I thought at the time was like as big as the Amazon. But and th this little woods here, which I remember being lost in for hours and hours and hours. Okay, so she wasn't the best babysitter. But <laughs> it, was, it was incredible because this is where I learned to fall in love with biology. This is where I encountered my first frogs. And also to my mother's credit, she claims that this was my favorite book when I was a kid. I, I don't remember the book, but I've been trying to answer this question for a very, very, very long time. In fact, this could have been a title for my talk as well, What is a Frog? I'm going to start to start. I'm going to skip a few years. So I'm going to skip to about age 22. So you won't, you won't get the benefit of the first 22 years. But I got the opportunity at age 22 to go to Africa, something I dreamed about since I was a little kid. And, and not only did I get to go to Africa, National Geographic paid for it. So I literally got to become that person that I dreamed of becoming. It's like, in the truest sense of the word, dream come true. And I went there initially as a graduate student to work on these African bullfrogs. These are these bullfrogs, they, they, well I can show you how big they get. They get about as big as a one-year-old's head. And, and despite the fact that he looks terrified there, he did major in biology and, and is now running his own lab in biology, my son. And the males get bigger than the females. And I was interested both in the behavioral ecology of, because the males do all of this parental care, but I was also interested in how hormones affected the growth rates such that the males ended up larger than the females. And this is work that I did as a graduate student um, with Paul Licht at, at UC Berkeley. I then later started working in Kenya in the Arabuka Sokoke, the African bullfrogs are from down here. And while working in the Arabuka Sokoke, 
I, I got introduced to this frog. A and now this is where all the pesticide mess is going to start. So again, I was interested in this sexual dimorphism. This is a frog where the males and females look completely different. And I was interested in behavioral ecology, like why are they different? What are they doing different in the environment that they need to be different colors? But I was also interested in the endocrinology. How did they come to be differently colored? And so because we first showed that they all start out green, we hypothesized that estrogen was involved somehow because only the females change color at puberty or at sexual maturity. And so we did these really simple experiments where to test this hypothesis, we, we just dip the frogs in different hormone solutions. So literally, if you dip them in testosterone, nothing happens. If you dip them in estrogen, you, you can induce a color change. Even in a male, you can make them change color. And then, this funny thing happened, actually. 1993, February 15th. I remember the day because it's the day before my son was born. And I was talking about my color changing frog at UC Davis and my wife went into labor and I had to leave the talk immediately and, and my son was born the next day. But on the drive back home, my wife, the species, Hyperolis artist, my wife said, oh, you should patent that frog. And so we, we did, we patent that frog. We call it the Hyperolis Argus endocrine screen or the haze test. And this, believe it or not, is how I got involved in all this sort of pesticide stuff. I got involved because here's why you patent a frog. There's a control, so they all start out green. If you give them estradiol, which is the natural estrogen that circulates in everything from fish to frogs, dogs, hogs, humans, they'll change color. Ethanol estradiol is the estrogen synthetic one that's used in birth control pill, and they'll change color if you expose them to that. DES is a potent pharmaceutical estrogen that'll make my frog change color. And DDT is an insecticide that just also happens to bind the estrogen receptor and will make them change color. So we screened dozens of compounds and showed that every estrogen that made my frog change color was also known to promote breast cancer. What's more is we showed that we could block the color change by exposing the frog to tamoxifen, which is an anti-estrogen, an antagonist, that's used to treat breast cancer. So that's why we patent the frog, that, that we could have this screen that we could use to detect chemicals in the environment and also that detection, based on our studies, would tell us something about chemicals that might also be harmful to humans. I was influenced at that time, I was a brand new assistant professor, and I was influenced really by three people. One was Howard Byrne, who was a mentor of mine and who had discovered the DE, a, a problem with DES in humans and was just starting to introduce this term endocrine active compounds. The term endocrine disruptor was probably first coined by Theo Colborn. And Lou Gillette was very popular for his work in the field looking at potential endocrine disruptors and how they impact the alligator development. They've all three passed away now. But they all three had a, a big influence on how I got involved in this endocrine disruptor thing. Well, then I got introduced to what I call a grown-up term, intellectual property. And this was the other key that got me involved in this endocrine disruptive stuff and working with the chemical industry. Because the university, it's their intellectual property. I mean, they weren't in the basement changing frogs and washing tanks and things, but it's their intellectual property. And you have to show that you're going to make money, otherwise they'll sell the intellectual property. So it was then that I got asked by the largest chemical company in the world to, to examine atrazine. And, and for those of you who don't know, who haven't seen me speak, this is atrazine. It's a so-called S-chlorotriazine. It's a weed killer, mostly used on corn. Since 1958, it's been used. We use 80 million pounds still. At the time, it was the number one selling uh, chemical in the world. And it's used in more than 80 countries, but it's now outlawed in all of Europe. Of course, the irony being that the, the, that the company's based in Europe and they're not allowed to use it there. So the first reason I call this America's top model is the company didn't want to use my frog because it was unknown. They wanted me to use Xenopus lavis, another African frog, because it's a very popular animal used in developmental biology. I didn't like Xenopus at all. The name Xeno, foreign or strange, says it all. It's, it's like not even a frog. It can't hop or jump. It has no tongue. It has a unique sex-determining gene that 
even other species in the genus don't have. But because this frog was once used in pregnancy tests, it's very popular in developmental biology. It's very easy to raise in the lab, very easy to breed, and now the genome's been sequenced. So they wanted me to use Xenophus lavis as their model. And so we did. In fact, though, I could probably call this talk, See What Happens <laughs> When Money Gets Involved, not because of just the industry, but also because instead of buying my Xenophus, and this is going to become important at the end of the talk, instead of buying my Xenophus from a company, or instead of paying all the money to go back to Africa to get my Xenophus, I went on a camping trip with my son, and I collected African clawed frogs in San Diego. So I, I usually refer to mine as African American clawed frogs, but this was <laughs> This was, the, this was the cheapest way to get the frogs and to have, you know, some enjoyable time with, with my son and eventually my daughter. Now, that's going to become important at the end of the talk. In brief, we showed that atrazine inhibited growth of the voice box in males, growth of the larynx. We also showed that when they're exposed as larvae, that some animals develop as hermaphrodites. They have a mixture of testes and ovaries, which I constantly have to point out to people who've seen Jurassic Park that this is not normal. Frogs don't normally change sex, and frogs aren't normally hermaphrodites. We formulated a hypothesis, and now we have molecular data to support the mechanism, that the way that atrazine works, it's not an estrogen mimic, but what it does is it activates an enzyme that causes the conversion of testosterone into estrogen, an enzyme called aromatase. And it does that by interacting with a phosphodiesterase, it, it, things that we don't have to talk about now. The result is the frogs are demasculinized because they lose their testosterone and they're subsequently feminized because now they're producing estrogen inappropriately. So we, we were able to measure that the testosterone, in fact, was decreased in these atrazine-treated males. And this is all stuff that we published in our first PNAS paper, which, which did not make the company happy. Subsequent to that, we set out to test a couple things that weren't tested in this first paper. One, we wanted to know if these hermaphrodites, like the ones I showed you, were males with ovaries or females with testes. But at the time, we couldn't determine who was a male genetically and who was genetically female. We can now, and I'll, and I'll show you. And we also wanted to know what happens when they become adults. Do they stay hermaphrodites? Do they turn into females? Do they turn into males? And, and, and the short answer is, at least in this population we looked at, at least 10% completely turn into females. So by now, there's a gene called DMW that is expressed in the female. So you can use qPCR to genotype and determine who's really a male and, and who's a female. So that's a male, genetically. And genetically, that's a male, They're missing DMW. But the animal, even though it's genetically a male, can lay eggs and completely function as a female. Well, then we did these studies that I call the pool party studies. And these are studies where I wanted to take atrazine-exposed males that have been exposed all their life to atrazine and determine whether or not they could compete for females. So I call them pool party experiments because we did them in the basement of our building where we literally just put in four females, four control males, four atrazine-treated males. And I know this is not the sex ratio you want when you go to the club, if you're a guy anyway. But we wanted the females to be limited. And so, so we did these tests and, and we could show, so here's how it works. Put the frogs in there at 7 p.m. Lights go out, put on a little Marvin Gaye, and young people don't know anything about that. And then you just come back in the morning. So it's real simple. You just come back in the morning and, and look at who got the hookup and who didn't. So there's surgical threads in there so we can determine who's who and, and, and follow who's successful. And if you do that, you find out that the atrazine-treated males almost never get the female. As you might guess, testosterone's involved. So for example, if you look at on average, the control males, and this is over four pool parties. We actually did five, but one morning one of the students kicked the pool and we couldn't see who was together to, to throw that one out. But what's more important is not the average testosterone levels. What's more important are the individual levels because the males, the ones that make the love connection, get the female. And we now know that whether or not you get the female doesn't matter for size in this species. What matters is your testosterone levels the night before the party. That's what matters. And in these atrazine-treated males, with the exception of these three, two of whom got the, the female, simply don't have enough testosterone to be competitive. Either that or they just get beat up by the other males, or the females don't like them. That, that answer we don't know. And then I did a series of things that I call the Motel 6 experiments. And that's where we housed individual males and females and compared 
the fertility of atrazine treated males versus control males. Because you kind of can't do a sperm count on a frog in, in any kind of accurate way. So this is a fertility test for the males where this is an unfertilized egg. Is we simply calculated how many eggs were fertilized after a night in a Motel 6 experiment. Real complicated. <laughs> There's a student sitting there going, one, two, <laughs> three. He actually went to law school. <laughs> That's what happened. Anyway, the bottom line is these males, even if there's no competition, they don't even try to get the female. And even if they do try, if you look at their testes under the microscope, and we did all the fancy statistics and calculating sperm density and things like that, but it's, it should be obvious to you that this guy over here, there's sperm in the testis and the testicular tubules. And if I blow this up, this is mostly cellular debris. So they don't have enough testosterone to show the behavior, and they didn't have enough testosterone to maintain sperm count, even if they tried to copulate with the female. And then by this time, where we are in my timeline, is I'm a full professor by now. Another PNAS paper, nine undergraduates co-authored it. I always point that out, that's important to me. Every one of them has a PhD or an MD now. Also very important to me. So now for the new stuff. That stuff is all published. The first little bit I'll talk about was, and I had pictures of all my graduate students. I don't normally talk about their work, but the pictures they sent me were so big that it slowed down my PowerPoint. So the only one I have now is Mai, who's my senior graduate student. And she's finishing up her dissertation now on, on something that's sure to get me in a lot more trouble than, than I've already been in. Because she came to me one day and she says, it's really hard to clean the tanks. I have to keep pulling them apart. I said, what do you mean you have to keep pulling them apart? Because they're all male. I mean, they're all genetic males. I'll, I'll show you how I'm going to do that later. And, and sure enough, sometimes you go in and this is happening. And I, I, had per, I had never seen this before. So it turns out that if you compare, and these are big tubs that have like 40 frogs each. And, and, and I said, okay, well, let's, let's take a set of tubs and just count. So each day she would go in and just count the number of pairs. So the first day, there's 10 in the atrazine treated tank, not in the control. There's the next day. There's the next day. Sometimes it happens in controls, but there's a much, much higher frequency of male-male copulation in the actors in treated tanks. And, and again, these are all genetically male frogs. None of them have ever seen a female, ever. Well, then I had her do this experiment. I, I just think of this stuff off the top of my head. So she, she went in on day one, okay? And so there's some, and it happens in the controls sometimes. I said, how about if we take the ones that are on the bottom the ones that are, quote, behaving or acting as the female, how about if we take those out and give them, put them in the control tank? And so she did that. She pulled them out, and, and there's a little bit of increase in the control, but it goes away in the atrazine treated tank. Okay, so the next day she's more thorough. She takes all of them out, puts them back in the atrazine treated tank. They get more pairs. Pulls them out again, she puts them in the control tank. She pulls them out again, puts them back in the atrazine treated tank. But I didn't get the idea is that the ones that seem to be behaving as the female, the ones that are on the bottom, and I, there's one last one, seem to be driving the behavior, seem to be attracting the other males. And, and, and these are the same individuals. The ones on the bottom don't switch. You never find them on the top. They're always on the bottom. Well, so then I had an idea. I thought maybe it's big males overpowering little males. You know, maybe it's not really copulation behavior. But, and, 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 so we tried that. So here again is, are the numbers in the control versus the atrazine treated tanks. And then I had her, after she'd marked them, pull them all out on one day to test the hypothesis that it was size related. And in fact, it's just the opposite. The ones on the bottom are always bigger, which is interesting because in this species, females are bigger than males. So it's not big males overpowering little males. The ones on the bottom are always bigger. What's probably more important is that ones on the bottom, if you look at the, the, the pairs, the ones on the bottom have lower testosterone levels than the ones that are on top. So we pulled them apart and took blood samples. And what's probably more important is that the ones on the bottom have estrogen levels that are equivalent to what you'd find in a female. Even though they're genetically male, and even though they have testes, they have hormone levels that look, you think those were female hormone levels, and they're behaving the way you'd expect females to behave. It's not entirely true, what I just told you. Here's what some of them look like inside. So those are testes, for sure. This is an atrazine treated male. But all that, that shouldn't be there. That's oviduct. So that's the equivalent of a human XY male with a uterus. So they have some female parts. They have 
female typical hormone levels, they have some female parts, or typically female parts, and their behavior is like a female. So I think, and one of the things a current graduate student is looking at is that, uh, you know, it's not necessarily binary, but there's a spectrum within these atrazine treated tanks. So for example, there are some males that you can treat with atrazine, and I'll, I'll show you more data later, later, that have normal testosterone levels. This is what the cloaca of a male should look like. They have these testosterone dependent um, breeding glands. They have a larynx that, that's large like this. So the muscle goes all the way around the larynx. And they have sperm in their testis. So some males, and they copulate on top. So some males, it's, it's like they don't even see the testosterone. I mean, it's like, like they don't even see the atrazine in the tub. In that same tub, you might have other males that are slightly demasculinized. They have low testosterone levels. The, their cloaca still looks like a male's. They have very faint breeding glands. They have a larynx that's large, but it's shaped like a female's. I'll show you what a female's looks like in a second. And, and they have no sperm in the testis, and they typically aren't involved in copulation at all. Then we have males that are not only demasculinized, but they're partially feminized, okay? So they, they actually have detectable estrogen levels. They have a cloaca. I call them cloacal labia. I don't know if that's the real name for it, but I've published it now, so it is. So <laughs> they have cloacal labia. They have no breeding glands, and, and they have some, quote, female parts, like this animal with oviducts, and they behave as if they're female in terms of their copulatory position. And then we have some animals that are completely feminized. They have high estrogen levels. They have protruding cloacal labia. They, they have no breeding glands. There's what the larynx looks like. So see the muscle ends at what's called a thiohyral, as opposed to going all the way around. And, and they have eggs. But you, if we didn't have the DMW gene to measure, you couldn't tell them from a ZW or, or a genetic female. So you could really call this slide, and this part of talk, duh, that not every individual responds the same. That there's variation, even within a tank, within a SIP chip, and how they respond. It'd be like if I released a toxin in this room, some people might die, some people might get injured, some people might be unaffected. So duh, we know that there's variability. I'm not sure why we're so surprised. Now, there's another part of the talk that I'll come back to that could be called, see what happens when money gets involved. Because the industry said they couldn't believe it at all. They said research that we have funded does not support the conclusions that Hayes is drawing from his own research. Which was originally kind of confusing because the, one of the authors said that they were unable to reproduce the low concentration effects in the larynx and gonads that, that have been shown elsewhere in the scientific literature. But their publication actually showed that there were hermaphrodites in their study just like mine. And in fact, if you look at the data where they said they couldn't repeat theirs, the arrows showing their data, they pretty much got the same kinds of results in terms of frequency of response to atrazine that I got, and they got better p-values. But I guess that's what happens when, you <laughs> when money gets involved. What they said in the paper, though, was that they threw out the top group, and then that made the p-values all not significant. And what study would the p-value not become significant if you throw out the groups that were affected? I don't know. That's a little trick. Now, let's put aside the atrazine for a second. And, and, and I have some hyperlinks in here. Let's see if this works. Oh, it does. Because I want to explain to you now some of the things that we tried to do to more streamline these kinds of studies, to study so-called endocrine disrupting compounds. Want a quick lesson on sex determination and Xenopus labus. And keep in mind, no other frog has this gene or this mechanism. This is unique to Xenopus labus. The males are ZZ, or homogametic, and the females are ZW, or heterogametic. And in males, there's a gene called DMRT1, which we also have, fruit flies and, and, and worms, everything has DMRT1. And this is a male-determining gene. There's a bunch of steps in there that we don't know. But in the absence of a W chromosome, you develop testis. If you're ZW, you have a variant of DMRT1 called DMW. So it's a, it's a different version of DMRT1. And DMW blocks DMRT1, so it stops you from becoming a male, from developing testis. And it turns on a gene called FOXL2, which is a transcription factor, which turns on a gene called CYP19, which codes for aromatase. And aromatase converts testosterone into estradiol, and that's how you get an ovary. So what we're doing now, as I'll show you, is we know that we can give these animals estradiol, and you can make ZZ 
animals grow ovaries because you, all the genes downstream of estradiol, estrogen, which aren't known, will give you an ovary. And what atrazine is doing is by turning on aromatase, it's inappropriately causing CYP19 to come on, the gene for aromatase. And so even if you're ZZ, if you're exposed to atrazine, you can develop ovaries or become a ZZ female. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Because if that didn't make sense, none of the rest of my talk will make any sense. So what we wanted to understand, as I said before, is whether or not these hermaphrodites were males with ovaries or females with testes. And the way that we ensured that, because this was before we even knew or had a probe for the BMW gene, is the way that we did that was we generated all ZZ populations. And we did that the, the following. Take a, a normal male and female, genetically male, genetically female, you cross those, then you give them estrogen to all the tadpoles, the larvae. That produces 100% females. But you know that half of those females have to be ZW, genetically female as well, the other half are ZZ females. So they're genetically male, but they make ovaries. And then we cross those back to genetic males so that we know we'll only have 100% ZZ animals. So we've eliminated the W chromosome and we've eliminated genetic females from this population. That way we can treat with atrazine and know, and in this case we grew them up for two years, that every one of the females that we produce, we know that they're ZZ that they're genetically male. Does that make sense? Okay. And, and these are those uh, individuals, and we can show, for example, now that we have a probe for it, we can do PCR and genotype them and show that, in fact, the females that come out of those populations are, in fact, genetic male. That makes sense. Okay. We followed up on these studies by treating all ZZ populations with, with estrogen. And we wanted to also treat them with more endocrine disrupting compounds and more variants of estrogen. Now, this part of the talk can be called, see what happens when money gets involved. Because it's expensive to buy all those chemicals. So we started doing this study. I said, look, let's figure out the minimum dose that we have to use so we can minimize how much money we're spending on chemicals. Remember, I'm getting my frogs free from San Diego. Now I'm trying to figure out how to get as much out of them as possible by not spending money on the chemicals. So we did this experiment, and, and remember these are all ZZ animals. There should be no females in here. So, and we treat it with different doses of estrogen, and the yellow's gonna always be hermaphrodites, and the reds are gonna be females. So we thought, ha, th there's what we can do, is we can go all the way down to three parts per billion, or three nanograms per mil. That should be enough to do our experiments. Okay, then that pair of animals died. So I had students go back and said, okay, we have to repeat this. And so we took another pair of animals and we repeated the experiment and, and, and here's what we got. And now compare that and so, and so here's what those look like. So there are the ovaries, they're long and lobed and pigmented and their testes, they're short and unpigmented. And if you look at them under the microscope, the ovaries have this hole in the middle called ovarian vesicle and, and the testes don't have that by histology. But that does not look like the answer we had before. Here's the answer we had before. So we got another pair of animals. I said, oh, let's do the experiment again. That's what we got. We got another pair, and, and here's what the hermaphrodites look like. So you can see that they truly are. Those are testes, and, and I'll blow that up for you. There's the ovaries with the ovarian vesicle. And then we got another pair of animals, and the estrogen didn't work at all. These are all being done by the same student in the same room. We got all these different answers. So then I said, gee, what's going on? So we repeated this with all these different sources of animals. And so these are San Diego. These are African-American clawed frogs. These are from Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. These are from NASCO. It's a company, Xenopus Express and Xenopus Warner Companies. And PF stands for Pachestrum. It's some animals that I got in South Africa and brought back. So if you just look at the three nanograms per mil, look at the incredible variation that you get in response to estrogen. Then I thought, maybe it's every time you breed a frog, it just produces larvae that respond differently. Maybe it has nothing to do with the source or the pairs of animals. So we replicated this using multiple pairs from all these different populations, just to see if we could repeat it. So that's San Diego, that's Golden Gate, and, and these are the companies that, that sell these things. And these are the animals from Pachestrum. The animals from Pachestrum from the wild appear to be a little more variable. 
than some of the other populations. So each one of those graphs are tadpoles from a different pair of frogs from that population. And then I had my student, Kara Huh, she was an undergrad at the time. I thought maybe it's the interaction between temperature and, and, and the hormone. Because, for example, if you look at 17 degrees, that's pretty cold. 27 degrees is about as hot as they can go. What this is showing is the number metamorphosis. And the idea is, if you're at a lower temperature, one, you take longer as a tadpole, so you're exposed for a longer period of time, but also maybe you're metabolizing the hormone less quickly. And maybe different sources of frogs have a different temperature sensitivity. So we did this experiment with three different populations at three different temperatures, and, 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 and here's the answers that you get. Temperature doesn't make any difference for any of the populations. It looks like, remember the red's always females, it looks like that, that, that the estrogen is a little less effective in the middle temperature, but there's probably nothing statistically significant. So why? And, and the bottom line is I, I don't know the answer to why. But <laughs> how, can you, how can you change the sensitivity to, to, to estrogen? That, that I don't know the answer to. But I had a graduate student who just finished a couple years ago, and she looked at vitiligenin expression. Vitiligenin is a gene that's expressed in the liver that's directly responsive to estrogen. And she compared a population that seems insensitive to estrogen based on the feminization effects on the gonad and a population that's, that's insensitive. So typically vitiligenin is regulated by estrogen, binding to the estrogen receptor, interacting with the estrogen receptor response element, and, and so it's directly regulated, this gene vitiligenin. And what she showed was that the populations that are more likely to turn into females are also expressing more vitiligenin um, um, relative to the populations that don't respond. So it suggests that there may be something about the receptor that's different in these sensitive populations. She did an RNA-seq analysis, however, and showed that most of the genes that appear to be different are genes that code for steroidogenic enzymes. So they may be metabolizing the estrogen if they're insensitive or producing more of their own estrogen in the case of the sensitive populations. Now, here comes, the, here comes kind of the crazy part. I decided, this is driving my students crazy, by the way. I decided I wanted to try to see if this sensitivity was heritable. So I'm going to show you a series of graphs. Remember the blue? They're all genetically males. There's no W chromosome in any of these populations. Okay, That's important. The blue are all males, so that's going to be a control on the left. And these are animals all exposed to three nanograms per mil. So this is an insensitive population. So they're the controls. When you give it estrogen, only about 10% are turning into females or growing ovaries. So it's an insensitive population. And, and the next thing we did is we said, well, we checked whether or not there was repeatable. So this is the same pair of animals from Xenopus Express bred over in 2011 and 2013. So they breed true. It's repeatable. And we've done it many, 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 many more times than, than, than I'm going to show you. So then we took this Xenopus Express male who produces these resistant offspring, right? And we gave him a female from San Diego. And, and so now it looks like the female can convey some of her sensitivity. So we have this resistant male over here, XE, Xenopus Express, cross with Xenopus Express. But when we cross the San Diego animal, looks like some of the sensitivity goes over. Does, does that make sense? And so sorry, this is a San Diego male from an insensitive population crossed with a female, this same exact same female. So it looks like the male conveyed sensitivity to the female in their offspring. Does that make sense? So these guys are half sibs. Okay. I, I, if that made sense, it, then you just wait, because the next bit of stuff won't make sense at all. So what we have here now, this is a Xenopus Express male crossed with a female from San Diego. So it looks like he made her resistant. So it looks like the heritability is through the male, right? If you give a sensitive female, a resistant male, wait, sorry, I said that backwards. If you give an insensitive female, uh, uh, a male from a sensitive population, her offspring look like they've inherited the male's sensitivity. And here, if you give a resistant male to a sensitive female, it looks like they inherit the resistance. Does that, does that make sense? Okay. It, it won't in a second. Because now, this is the same female but crossed with a San Diego male. So you can see it looks like the male is conveying resistance in this case, but relative to that. Does that make sense? Okay. 
Then, this is the same male, but crossed with a San Diego female. So this guy who's been resistant with all these, produced resistant larvae with all these other populations, you give this super female from San Diego and she could care less about his resistance. 100% of her offspring are transformed. So it looked like the male was determining whether or not they're sensitive or insensitive, but in this case, this, this female don't care. She's like the honey badger. And here she is crossed with a San Diego male, same male that's up there. This is another female, in fact, this is her sister, cross with him, completely sensitive. Despite the fact that he made all of these females, he produced offspring that were resistant to estrogen. And then, here's the San Diego cross. Now you should see a discrepancy. In the controls, we have females showing up. There's no W chromosome in this population. I thought, my students must have screwed up. They must have dipped some estrogen over into the tank. But we repeated that multiple times. And this particular female, always produces some proportion of the animals. They have never seen estrogen. There's no W chromosome. Yet we have ZZ animals growing ovaries, and they're fully functional. I'll show you. We can grow them up without estrogen and without a W chromosome. Those are the grandchildren of my original P PNAS frog. So it turns out that that's how we produced that female that you saw in the, in the, in the, in the photograph just a second ago. 10% of those ZZ animals turned into females with atrazine. In the next population, it went up to 40% in the next generation. In the next generation, we started to get spontaneous females, even though they had never seen atrazine, and now we have females that are all Z. There hasn't been a W chromosome in this population from all the way back here, and 80% of the ZZ animals come out of this. We've evolved a new sex determining system in the lab, possibly by epigenetics because of the atrazine exposure in a previous generation. But we've evolved a new sex determining mechanism. And again, my student, I mean, how do you do that if you don't have DMW? How do you make females? And so my student did RNA-seq and qPCR to try to look at which of these genes in this pathway might be spontaneously coming on in the absence of estrogen. A and it turns out she didn't find any of them, so it must be something downstream of, of what estrogen turns on. Does that all make sense? No, we don't, know. We, we don't know how it works. But we have all the populations to do it. D it should be duh, because these epigenetic effects and cross-generational or transgenerational effects have been shown over and over and over and over again in, 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 in other animals. So I'm not sure why, why we're so surprised at that. Why does this end? Oh, yeah, see, there's another hyperlink. And now, this is my all-time favorite slide. What this slide shows is these are different pairs of animals. The colors reflect the different populations, okay? So these are ones that are completely sensitive, 100% of the offspring, and three nanograms per mil turn into females. This one's almost completely resistant. And what's interesting is all of the populations that are more sensitive are all wild or feral populations. So they're either from South Africa, San Diego, or San Francisco. And all of these animals that are on the resistant side of the curve are all from commercial suppliers. Yeah. So this could be called a toad is a toad is a toad is a toad, sort of out of sarcasm. People talk about xenopus. They talk about the effects of chemicals on frogs and amphibians. What they really mean is on xenopus, and you can get any kind of response that you want. That, that's why you just call this, duh. We know that there's variability. We know that's why we have strains of mice and strains of rats and different cell lines. We know that there's variability or difference, but in science, everybody wants repeatable results. So you, 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 you pick the line, but that line may not be telling you, one, anything about Xenopus, if you pick the wrong line. And two, it certainly can't be used then as a model, America's next top model, as a model to predict the effects on other species when you have such variability. This could also be called, see what happens when money gets involved. Because if I were a chemical company, and I wanted to, let's say, discredit a scientist's work, I could give you any answer you want, depending on how I pick the line. If I were testing your chemical and I wanted to show that it wasn't estrogenic, I'd just pick one of these lines, because even estrogen's not estrogenic in those lines. So if you wanted to discredit somebody and say, oh, his work isn't repeatable, eh, that'd be one way to do it without, without actually lying. That'd be one way that you can honestly say research that we have funded does not support the conclusion that Hayes is drawing from his own research, because they were using, remember I was cheap. I got my animals from San Diego. They were using the commercial populations. 
Now, whether or not they knew that or not, I, I, I don't know. They claim they didn't know it. When they talked in New Yorker magazine, spokesperson for Syngenta said, in fact, quote, I am troubled by a suggestion that we have ever tried to discredit anyone. Our focus has always been on communicating the science and setting the record straight. She's troubled by a suggestion that they've ever tried to discredit anyone. It was just me maybe being paranoid. I don't know. Well, it turns out they lost a $105 million lawsuit and all of their secret documents for the last 20 years became public. Filed under seal, they all became public. You can go online and get them now, privileged and confidential. Where on earth that I, could I have the audacity to claim that they were trying to discredit me? Well, it turns out when their notes came out, look at their strategy under science. <laughs> 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 but she is troubled at the notion that they have ever tried. Somebody sat in a meeting and wrote that down. That was their number one goal for science. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if my colleagues knew exactly what they were doing when they purchased their animals from Xenophus Express. I found out, because I was trying to be cheap and trying to figure out what's the least amount of estrogen I can use, well, there's incredible variation. And now I have two graduate students. Kara, my graduate student, said, well, I want to study why these animals are more sensitive. And she got in an argument with my new graduate student. I said, don't worry, there's two problems here. You can study why these animals are more sensitive. How about you go to the other end and study why these animals are so insensitive? Maybe you'll get the same answer, maybe you won't. Whoever gets it first gets the PhD. So I, <laughs> I could have called this right back where we started. And I could have called this right back where we started because we're back in San Diego. And the reason we're back in, there's Karen. She's actually in med school now, but she loves catching frogs so much. She'll come back and, and help me catch frogs in San Diego. And, and the reason that we're right back where we started is, is the following. That's the park ranger showing us where we've been collecting. And, and here's a map of where I collected 25 years ago with my son, where my frog population came from, that red arrow. What the ranger was pointing out is there are also Xenopus further upstream. And I literally mean upstream, because you know what all that is in the middle? That's a golf course. So in the same way that we've been treating our frogs for the last 25 years and getting these epigenetic effects and changing their sensitivity and evolving different mechanisms, Maybe the same thing's happening because they use incredible amounts of atrazine, among other chemicals, on golf courses. So now we're doing these studies where, that's my postdoc, where we're going out and measuring blood levels upstream and downstream of a golf course. And then I have this crazy idea that, that we can do pool parties in the field, just like we did in the lab, comparing control and atrazine. What if we just drive up to the joint, fill the, <laughs> this is seriously happening, fill the, 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 what do you call it, the bed up with water, take males from upstream, and males from downstream and compete them right in the back of a truck. I don't know, I think it's a crazy idea. It's so crazy, maybe, maybe people should listen to some of Syngenta's notes here. They, they listed things that they were gonna do that were more risky. Psychological profile, yeah, maybe, maybe we should do that. Contact Berkeley, contact academics, so maybe they should, that's kind of crazy. Here's the other reason that I could, I could call this right back where we started. Because where I started was here. Remember I told you I grew up with all the swamps and frogs? This is what it looks like now. It's all paved. I don't know if I would have become a biologist if I were growing up there now, growing up there now, because it's all gone. In fact, the only place where you can still find frogs and wildlife it, it, significantly is the only national park in South Carolina. And I get to go back there. I get to take my students back. And, and there's Karen. So they, even though she's in med school, they like to come back and, and play in the swamp. And interesting, this article just came out that the park is contaminated with you guessed it, atrazine and ethanol estradiol. And the whole article focused on people who come there canoe. What if they fall in the water? Completely ignoring the low-income black community that lives in that area, that's exposed all the time, and completely ignoring why the park is here in the first place. And that is to protect the wildlife that's here. So right back where I started, atrazine's back in my life again. The EPA is finally issued after 20 years that atrazine likely <laughs> harms most species of plants and animals. I, I told them that 20 years ago, but you know, nobody was listening to me. And, and California has finally listed atrazine as a reproductive toxin. So right back where we started, I think I've made a difference. I always talk about taking the hood to Harvard, and I'm finally figuring out how to take Harvard back to the hood, and hopefully a place where I can have an impact on environmental health and, and public health as well. So with that, I'm done. And I apologize, I have an incredible cramp in my leg. I'm about to die, <laughs> but I'll take questions if there are. <laughs> Excuse me for a second. Oh. Questions or comments? Maybe I should eat a banana. Oh. 
I'm listening. I'm just trying to stretch my path here. Questions? Comments? Um, so, if I'm understanding the question properly, there are different subpopulations of Xenopus, and I've had, the, I've had all of our populations genotyped. And so, every one of our San Diego, Golden Gate, and all the companies, the source is a pop original source is a population near Cape Town. The only one that's different in terms of the different um, subpopulations is the one from Pontchartrain. They're considered a different, same species, but, but different race, if you will. Um, so they're, they're from the same original populations. It could very well be, my guess is, that in each case you've had a bottleneck, maybe because they were exposed to atrazine or some other chemical, maybe not. So, because we've gone back to San Diego now, there's more variability than the lines that we have in my lab. My, my, our lines, I wasn't paying attention back then, might have all come originally from one female. So what's happened with these companies, I believe, is that they've just happened to select animals that were resistant and then they've bred that into their populations. I would guess, like with potrostrum, if you go back into the wild, you'll see a much broader range per population. So it's not a real population difference, it's because they've been sort of artificially selected. Um, in terms of gene expression, um, the candidate genes that my student identified that we're now looking at all seem to be involved in steroidogenesis, not genes that are involved in estrogen receptor. And, and, and we don't know what's downstream of the estrogen receptor in terms of the, the gonadal response. Is that, is that it? Yes. Of atrazine? Yeah, so we've, um, there's a guy named um, Zal Beasley, who's published, originally published a study showing that uh, animals collected in the field that were exposed to atrazine have feminized gonads. They have so-called eggs in their testes. We published a study in Nature. Um, we did a transect across the United States and showed a correlation between atrazine contamination and that same feature, these testicular oocytes. I, I made that word up, but it's published now, so people have to use it. It's one of the things, for some reason, that really upsets the company. And there's been a couple of other papers that have looked at atrazine. There's one in Florida, um, and at least one in Canada, that have looked at atrazine effects in the wild on not only amphibians, there's a bunch of amphibians, but also studies that have shown effects in turtles and fish both in the lab and in the water. And we have a much larger study that we haven't published yet, where we've looked all across the country. We followed the Mississippi, the Missouri, and the North Platte River. So we have gradients of no atrazine to high atrazine level. But, and the sample size is in the tens of thousands. We haven't published it yet. Yes? I, uh, well, here's one of those questions that I'll get in trouble for. I would guess yes, in, in either direction, because if you are, so if you're a hermaphrodite, you're essentially not reproductively functioning. If you are a male that's copulating with other males, not only are you not reproductively functional, but you're tying up males that are. So I would guess that the way that you survive after you know, generations of atrazine or estrogen or anything is either you become more sensitive and you completely function as a female, or you would select for resistance and you, s and you function as a male and act like the estrogen's not there. That would be my guess. I, but I don't know that there's any evidence. For, other than my lab, <laughs> I don't know that there's evidence. Well, I mean, you just saw in our case, we get it in like one generation. We, 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 get, we get differences, and you, and you can, get a change in sensitivity with each generation. I, until we get the, that one line that just starts spontaneously producing females, which now we can't even use for estrogen-treated studies, because 80% are coming out as female anyway. Yes? How, say again? How long has it been? I, 
Oh, how long has it been evolved? Mm -hmm. I, d it's only in Xenopus Labus. So the next closely related Xenopus does not have the DMW. Yeah, it's the only species that has a DMW. Xenopus tropicalis doesn't have DMW in their genome. It's not involved. And I, and I think there are even some populations of Xenopus Labus that don't have it. Certainly we have one that produces females without it. It's, it's still ZZZW, but that actual gene, it, it's not the same molecular mechanism. The chromosomal constitution is the same, I think, isn't it, in pipettes? I think it's the same across species. It's female heterogamity. But that particular gene on the, on the W chromosome only exists in Zenith uh, I'll bounce back and forth. Hmm. Um, in that, we have not, I mean, we can monitor by qPCR, we can monitor receptor expression. So a, a former student of mine, Dan Buchholz, did some of that work with me. Um, but we have not characterized the receptor. So we've tried to do radio receptor assays in Xenopus labus and have never gotten it to work for some reason. So to characterize the binding, that's one of the things we want to do. Um, we can get it to work in other organisms, but we've never been able to get adequate, at least data that I was satisfied with to, to characterize the receptor. One of the things that um, my student's doing now is using chemicals like tamoxifen and estrogen aromatase inducers and blockers and growing frogs up to try to look at the behavior and, and the um, sort of organization of the brain and how it's affected by steroids and endocrine active compounds. And my not, if by toad you mean bufo? Oh, really? What is the genus? Is it, is, is it a bufo? Oh, Leptodactylus? Okay, because if it's a bufo, bufo typically don't respond, the gonads anyway, to testosterone or estrogen. That's not a bufo, okay. No, I haven't. So that's one of the things we're doing in San Diego. So we're, I mean, now that we have that tool, so we're collecting, um, we have collected already, uh, there's a caveat, young metamorphs. And so we genotype them and examine their gonads. The, the caveat is we don't find breeding animals downstream at all. Right? And again, it's hard to prove then like, oh, stuff coming off the golf course. But I don't think they're breeding down there. I think they wash downstream and that's what maintains the population. Because we can get, I don't want to exaggerate, but we can certainly get hundreds of metamorphs upstream. Downstream, we've never seen them. We've never seen them breeding. But, and, and so we're collecting hormone levels from males and females upstream. And there's problems with that as well, because we have to trap them in funnel traps. And that probably changes their hormone levels as well. Um, but I don't, I don't have the answer. So we have animals that we've genotyped, and then we're looking at their gonads, both upstream and downstream. And thank you again. <laughs>